The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a diverse variety of films and events that we just wouldn't be able to offer in the in-person cinema experience. But I think what really makes it unique is the focus, not only on public health issues, but the issues that really concern communities of color. If you're looking for a reason to engage or to try it out, this is the perfect time. Just go to mkefilm.org slash mhff. Good evening. We are grateful for the opportunity to participate in the Milwaukee Film Minority Health Festival 2020 and to reflect on director producer producer Marilyn Meese's film, Charm City. This is a collaboration with the Race, Equity and Procedural Justice Committee from the court system, along with our distinguished panel. I also wanna say that our chief judge, Mary Trejano, sends greetings on behalf of our court system. What about the Race, Equity and Procedural Justice Committee and what's been those efforts? In 2013, a group of stakeholders working within the courts came together and began conversation on how to evaluate racial equity in the Milwaukee County justice system. Initially, the group decided that more justice professionals needed to become aware of the problematic intersection of race in the criminal justice system, as well as the need to take active steps against the status quo. In early 2014, the group garnered the approval of Chief Jeff Krimmers, and then thereafter, Chief Judge White, and now present Chief Mary Treggiano, closed the courthouse to allow for a full day of learning and conversation among the many agencies that comprise and serve the criminal justice system. This event was the first step in normalizing conversations about race in the justice system, collaboratively identify ways to eliminate disparities. Agency leaders and staff agreed that it was essential to keep the dialogue and education as a continuing event. The committee has since put on a total of six day-long conferences each year. The committee has dug deeper into the ways Milwaukee County and the justice system as a whole can improve. We have a PowerPoint that outlines the content of each of our conferences. Our most recent conference was held on February 28, 2020, with the generous assistance of the Milwaukee Film Festival's Black Lens, addressing the topic of equity in our criminal justice system through a series of short films followed by a facilitated breakout session. We have previously focused on our internal system partners, but we have for several years realized that we needed to incorporate broader community input. Recent events reinforce how crucial this is for all of us. The Race, Equity, and Procedural Justice Committee works in partnership with and is supporting the Milwaukee Community Justice Council, commonly referred to as the CJC. The Milwaukee Community Justice Council convenes local government, criminal justice and community leaders to ensure a fair, efficient, and effective justice system that enhances public safety, quality of life. The CJC is a central driver of justice reform in Milwaukee County, and we are grateful for their support. Now today, we have a distinguished panel to present you their view as they have seen the movie Charm City, and incorporate how that impacts what they view here in Milwaukee, the larger range, and I'm interested in, hopefully you are, and their comments, they should be outstanding. Our panelists include Michael Brunson, Acting Chief of the Milwaukee Police Department, Director of the City of Milwaukee Office of Violence Prevention, Sinead Jenkins, Vice President of Social Responsibility for the YMCA, 
Charlene Moore, Executive Director of the Urban Underground, and Ure, Team Program Coordinator, Peak Initiative. And we also expect um, Andre Lialis to join us shortly. Now, to get our panelists started, I want to ask our panelists, if they'd like to comment on what is your initial reaction to the Charm City film that you saw? Uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Judge, Judge Carl. Thank you, Judge Ashley, for having us here tonight. Um, my initial reaction um, was just that it was just all too unfamiliar, or all too familiar, I should say. Um, I saw so many glimpses of what happens here in Milwaukee in our backyard show up in the film. And so my initial reaction, I was not shocked at all, um, again, because I saw so many parallels to what we encounter here in Milwaukee. Thank you. Thank you, Shanae. I think, uh, Charlene, were you going to say something? No, I'm not. Go ahead. Hey, Monty. Mm -hmm. I would say my, my thoughts are very similar. And uh, it was a very familiar film. A lot of the things were very much so in parallel to the things that we experienced here in Milwaukee. And immediately after watching the film, I knew and understood exactly why the people who are on this panel were chosen to be on it, because they are very connected to the work um, that is similar to the work uh, of the folks uh, from the movie Park City. Thank you. Um, Judge Ashley, thank you so much for allowing us to have this opportunity to have this conversation. And I definitely have to echo both of those sentiments. Um, you know, the film really hit home when I think about what's needed to transform um, violence in a city. It has so many different layers. It's not just the police. It's not just the community. Right. It's not just elected officials or judges, like it's so many different layers that um, when we talk about transformation and when we talk about what are the pieces that are needed to build back a community. Um, and one of the things I got out of, you know, watching Charm City was just, it, it was relationships. Relationship building is so crucial, um, particularly for communities of color because of um, the historical context when we talk about policing and when we're involving race and equity in all of that. Um, so it was, it, it hit home. It definitely hit home. Thank you, Sean. Chief? Uh, Judge Ashley, can you hear me? Yes, Andre, please. Okay, we sorry about that. I'm using my phone. I'm using my phone right now, and I apologize. I I, I want to change to my computer, but um, I did all everything that everybody else said, and 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 to solve, especially in Milwaukee, what we have going on. It's 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 happening all over the the country, everywhere. People are experiencing. What do we do with the youth, the violence, and all of that in the community? So I think it's a collective coming together, and that's what I saw in the film. That it's going to take everybody doing their part. So, thank you, Andre. Chief, did you want to weigh in on that? Yes. Uh, for me, uh, it made me think back over my 25-year career. I would definitely comments that have been expressed so far here. Um, seeing the levels of violence in Baltimore was concerning, but also seeing the level of care by Mr. C, who was so engaged and invested in the young people's lives in Baltimore and efforts that he put forward. And also the young man, Alex, that was part of the safe interrupter group. Just his level of change as he talked about when his sister was brutally gunned down there. So it gave me some hope in looking at that and the involvement of the young city councilmen. So just how everyone were concerned about improving the environment there in Baltimore. So, so a mixture of sadness, obviously, and mixed with hope. Thank you, Thank you, Chief. 
Reggie, did you want to comment on what was your initial reaction to, to the movie Charm City? Uh, sure. Um, sorry, I had some technical difficulties getting in. Um, great to be on this panel with okay. all of you. Um, so this this is my second, probably my third or fourth time seeing the, the documentary, and and at this point, it's like watching Friends because um, I did befriend um, Captain Brown as well as um, the councilman who's now the mayor of Baltimore, um, and so just seeing their progression since this uh, documentary launched. Um, it was shown at the uh, film festival a couple years ago. They actually participated in a panel um, with the Milwaukee Police Department and OVP. And so um, just to underscore what, what Chief Brunson mentioned, um, you know, one of the things that we definitely see here, both with community activists as well as our violence interruption team, is that, all, you know, even though we pour our hearts and our souls into the community, we're not immune to also being impacted by the gun violence that we're seeing and the level of vicarious trauma that we carry um, as we show love and support um, to families and individuals impacted by violence. Um, we, I think as a community, need to do a better job um, of caring and, and helping the helpers. And so that's something that I think this documentary did a good job of underscoring. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. You know, I'd like us now to discuss how you saw the community members, law enforcement, political leaders and activists addressed the challenges facing their community? And which scenes informed your answer to that? I'm sorry, say, repeat the question. I wanted you to see if we could discuss how the community members, including law enforcement, the, the political leaders, there's been comments on that. People have pointed out some specific things that they saw from some of the components of that the program. But how did they address the challenges in their community and, and which scenes really resonated with you about your, your thoughts about how things were going and the opportunity to change the reality of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Because some of the interactions and some of the things, you know, were kind of chilling, uh, warming. Uh, there were both levels. There were times when you just felt you know, this is great. And there were times you scratched your head and wondered why certain things happened. I can, I can answer that one. Um, I don't remember the name of the young man and the officer in this scene, but I remember there was an altercation between a young man and his father. Um, I don't remember, I don't uh, know if you all remember that scene, but it was very, familiar, like we said in the beginning to me, to see how the, the officer, you know, approached the young man, came to his house while he was in his altercation with his father and was so gentle and met him where he was, had a very just, you know, real conversation with him, explained to him his parents' concern with him being, you know, out knowing the things that are going on in their community and was able to really diffuse that situation with a very general conversation and just showing that young man that, I'm here for you. Like, if you need me following this, I'm going to be around here checking for you and make sure you're okay. And I really, that scene really, really resonated with me because thinking about the people on this panel and the way that a lot of them have poured into me and other young people in the city is just, is, is very similar to that. Thinking about Andre, the Ellis and how he works with the young men in the community garden and they know that they have him as a support. Um, no matter what they have going on or what issues may arise, they can count on him to be there for him as a mentor and as someone to guide them. And then thinking about the, the work that Reggie and Charlene have done with Urban Underground and still to this day with 414 Life and you know being around in the community as a resource for those in the community who a lot of times feel like they don't have anybody to count on or to support them or to back them up when they're going through difficult times. So that scene really, really spoke to me and just really show how important it is for adults to step in in the lives of young people. And that's the beginning of us starting to fix some of these issues in our city. Imani, that was beautifully, awesome. yeah, that was really beautifully said, Imani. And I would love to just um, chime in um, and just make this a conversation because you know, when I think about that particular scene that you referenced and looking at the different um, pieces, the different elements in, um, in the documentary, just how pivotal and important it was um, for 
the community to support each other. Um, and I know we're in this, you know, really interesting space in our society right now where people are talking about defunding systems and defunding um, the police. What folks I think are really saying is that, you know, so for example, you know, there were there was a scene where they were working, the officers were working 12 hour shifts and you saw this there, you know, there was this one particular scene where they said, you know, you saw their door, the police officers doors go open and shut, open and shut. They were just, you know, dealing with a variety of different issues. And that even um, that scene that you referenced with the young man, did was a was a police really needed for that sort of um, altercation, right? There was, you know, an individual that was homeless. Um, you know, there were a, a variety of different issues that all we have is the police that had been called to. And it was great to see that some of the officers, how they dealt with, um, you know, people in their community, you know, when you referenced that, how that officer spoke to that young man, it was, I, I felt the, the genuineness and I felt the compassion, you know, because he's just like, I, I know what's going to happen. I've been in these neighborhoods. I've lived in these neighborhoods. And it was right. so compassionate. And unfortunately, when we look at a city like Milwaukee, who have residency, um, you know, the resi residency restrictions have lifted where officers no longer have to live in our communities. The, most of them don't look like us. And when they speak to us and, you know, I'm thinking about that scene where they were having the, um, the, the listening circles with the police yeah. and the young people. And how the officer was just like, yeah, I can have a, I can listen more. If I'm, you know, talking to a young person, I cannot assume what are you doing? Because, you know, it's that assumption that you're doing something wrong or you're doing something bad and not realizing like, these are young people. Think back to when you were young, right? But that initial sort of interaction. And so I'm hoping that um, you know, folks, you know, for those that haven't gotten an opportunity to see it, uh, to please do so. Yeah. And I would just, for me, it was the human element, right? So when I saw, um, Major Brown, uh, showing up as a mother, um, and having a conversation with her son when she was sending him off, um, just knowing that at any moment she's, she's hoping that the experience that he's going to have the second that he walks out of the door is a positive one. And then the very tough job that she has in her position. Um, even resonating with Alex at the loss of his sister and the fact that he was he was wearing multiple hats, um, but he still showed up in this human element. And going back to what Charlene referenced with the listening circles, where you had community coming together to listen, to truly understand and not necessarily to respond. I think that oftentimes in all of these roles, when we think about the work that we do and the work that we lead, we forget about the human element. And I really appreciated that. And even with the example of Officer uh, Eric Watson when he went shopping at the mall or stopped to pick up flowers for his girlfriend. I really appreciated the fact that um, you got a chance to see what they do when they're not quote unquote working. Because I think oftentimes we see people with a badge, we see people behind a uniform, we see people in their suits and their ties, and we forget that at the end of the day, their hearts beat just like ours do. They put their shoes on the same way that we do. And I think that that human element and seeing that show up is something that really resonated with me. Thank you, Shanae. Thank you. Well, let me tell you, uh, Imani, and the comment is great. I, I have to tell you, when the officer was talking to a young man, it was also the adult kind of must have called and said, there's a problem here, and called an officer to come over and talk about trauma-informed. And we talk about it in our system that you can re-traumatize, you can de-escalate, and support people to overcome their trauma. It's how you interact with folks. And there's preset notions about that you have and that we talk about relationships make a whole, whole big difference. Um, let me let me ask you this, are there any characters that you specifically had some, re re some references to people that you saw that you thought really gave you a certain resonance, you just felt like that was a huge thing for me to see. Are there other people in um, Charm City uh, film that you acted with or said, you know what, 
I'm connecting with you. Or not. I mean, briefly, I'll just say, you know, Andre Lee Ellis is our Mr. C. You know, when I first saw the documentary, that, that screamed out immediately. Um, you know, when we look at Alex and the fact that we have 4-1 for Life and we have community activists and other people who intervene, who work to de-escalate situations, who care about young people in a fearless manner, um, I feel like we have all the ingredients. Oftentimes we watch documentaries or watch movies and say, man, I wish we had that here. Um, and I remember when the Interrupters first premiered at the film festival here, this had to be like eight years ago at this point, uh, people were saying, man, we need a violence interruption program here and now we have one. Um, and so again, I think that just recognizing the assets that we have in our community um, and, and the, the same kind of grassroots um, approaches to community safety that they are doing in Baltimore, we're doing here as well. Well, with that being said, what kind of support systems and services are necessary to kind of transform what we have going on here? These are things in our community. You've made some references, Reggie, and, and clearly you, you are very, very focused on that in your position as director of the Office of Violence Prevention. But are there things that we're missing that we need to help support more recovery and better outcomes that you can see through that movie? I, again, I'll be very brief. I just want to underscore how important it is to have police leadership that embraces violence prevention. Um, I think Chief Brunson is a, a, a breath of fresh air with that um, and has always been committed to the blueprint, was involved in the planning process. Um, and so I just, I think that's really important. And when you don't have that, um, you know, I think that it, it, there's a breakdown because there shouldn't be, a, um, it shouldn't be looked at as an either or in terms of um, public safety versus enforcement because we work with families who've been impacted by violence, whether it's sexual assault, whether it's gun violence, and they want the person who harmed them held accountable. We can have a whole nother conversation about what accountability means and the whole criminal justice system and its deficiencies. But at the end of the day, um, it, you know, there's a significant amount of violence that's happening in our city. And it's important to understand and have officers and leadership that understands that they can't do this alone. Um, and, and to Charlotte's point earlier, you know, the fact that they're called to things that they should never be called to, things that they're not trained to respond to, um, increases harm to them and increases harm to the community. Um, and so again, I think having leadership that understands and embraces the role of public health and the role of prevention, um, I think is critically important and I think is an asset here. Well, thank you, Reggie. Thanks for those words. Chief? Yeah, thank you, Reggie. I agree. I mean, we have to have all systems working together to combat violence in our community. And when one entity is siloed or not communicating or not carrying their load, it, it, it's a struggle. And we need all hands on deck to address the problems that we see. You know, an interesting thing about Officer Eric, what's his name, Winston or Watson? It was one of them. It was Watson, okay. So one of the interesting things about looking at him and he had two years on the job at the time and him talking to that young man it did show his empathy his care for that young man but he said something later too about how he has to almost turn off his emotions because he went to so many violent incidents and repeatedly he's seeing this over and over and over again and so i can definitely relate to that you know, as a young officer, I rewind 23, 24 years ago when I was an officer working, trying to show empathy, but seeing over and over the level of violence that was in our city at the time. And, and yeah, it, it's it's a tough thing to do because, you know, my obviously, mostly everyone's natural inclination is to absolutely show empathy. And I still try to do that. But some of the things that police officers see repeatedly is pretty traumatic. And of course, you have the young people who live in Baltimore that are seeing those incidents of violence repeatedly. So they're being traumatized over their young lifetime also. And some people who've been there for 30 or 40 years are seeing that for that amount of time. So that trauma is just building up 
throughout the whole community. And, and that's one of the things that has to be looked at, has to be addressed. If I could add to that, I, um, Chief Brunson, I think you made a pivotal point as far as the, the trauma um, that occur on all sides, right? Um, if we're able to have more clinicians and um, you know more trained social workers and individual, we have to come from a place of healing. And I think that um, that hasn't been the central or pivotal role um, of our community um, in, in a very long time. And so we have to get back to what does healing look like um, trauma-informed care what does that look like we have to and, you know judge ashley when you ask like what's needed those are the things that are needed from in, in our schools in our neighborhoods right we have to begin to start healing ourselves and our community in order to see the shift and the transformation that we need and I'll just chime in really quickly because I think that Reggie mentioned this, um, Chief Bronson mentioned this, and even Charlene, when you think about collective impact, right? So, and the, and the whole mindset around pre prevention, um, neighborhoods, thinking about community-based organizations, um, the school systems, and understanding that there's not one entity that can do it alone. And the reference that Chief Brunson mentioned around silos, I think what COVID, when COVID hit, it truly demonstrated to everybody in the community of the importance of working together because that was there was not one entity that could try to manage the complexities that everyone was experiencing as related to um, the disparities and the the lack of access and things of that nature. Just as that as as that example. So I think that when we when we consider how we can engage nonprofit organizations, for profit entities, the school systems. Um, the clinicians and social workers and so on and so on and law enforcement, that's truly what's going to continue to make the difference. Do you, uh, as a panel, do you think that people understand trauma and its impact and how we can create lasting issues for families and individuals? Do you think those that you work with understand that? Is that, is that message out there yet? Not as much as it should be. I think there's a lot of work um, yet to be done. And I, I would agree. I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen. I don't think folks really understand the complexities. Even a child, you know, growing up in a home and you know seeing violence in their home, right, or um, living in a neighborhood um, and seeing violence occur to in their neighborhoods and understanding the impact and the long term impact that that can have on a person, and I mean, and really quick, if we think about our prison system, you know, there's a large percentage of people that are incarcerated for mental health issues. Guess what? We've criminalized someone for being mentally ill. That's a, that, that we're, we should be ashamed of ourselves as a society, you know, for moving in that direction and for removing the humanity you know, from, um, you know, from our communities. Thanks, Cheryl. And we often talk about that with the, with the criminal justice system. If the resources had been put into play much earlier, not only for the, the parents, but the children, the outcomes would be significantly different. And that's what we're talking about to some extent, uh, focusing on <laughs> prevention, Reggie, <laughs> to, to, to try to uh, change the trajectory of where people will be, where kids will be without a rotation of how we look and provide resources. So what are some of the factors that can undermine the well-being of our community? And we, I, I say that and I ask that and I'm the moderator, but I think a lot of you already talked about lack of resources at that early stage for folks to have different outcomes. Uh, I know as a judge sitting in court, uh, I knew I had young men in front of me, smarter than I'd ever be, smarter than I'd ever be, straight A student. And then two years later, he's locked up. Why is that? And is there something we can do? Because it's, it's a struggle for all of us at all levels to realize that we could have so much better outcomes for our young folks and our community if we were to allocate resources more efficiently 
and supportive for better outcomes. And it's a struggle. Uh, I know I'm a judge and I can't, you know, I got I got a line, I got to walk. So I, you know, I got to keep myself kind of neutral. But the reality is all of us, all of us play a role in changing the way things are. And that's an important thing to understand. And that's what the race equity and community, uh, race equity and procedural justice committee is trying to do with the system players. But as I noted when I gave my opening here, it's also about input, dialogue, understanding, so we have a better opportunity to learn from each other. Because I tell you, some people have blinders on about what's going on and are quick to say, well, if you just study hard, you can do it. If you just, you know, stay out of that trouble, you'd be okay. I would suggest to everyone that it's, and I know this group, I mean, I love this group because all of you are not only passionate, this is what you've been doing, every one of you. I wish Andre was on here because one of the, one of the parallels uh, is what Andre does and it's been noted. And, and all of the people on this panel have done things that I know have been tremendously important on changing the trajectory of people's lives. What more can we do? I mean, we have these discussions, but you know, what are the things that concretely we can do to help effectuate those changes? Judge, I know that you've said, you know, that it can be complex and I completely agree with you, you know, but when we look at how things had been, had, particularly looking at the country, how things were moved in this country when COVID hit, right? All of a sudden we were able to give millions of Americans, you know, a few thousand dollars to, you know, to put in their pocket to support, um, support themselves and their families. All of a sudden we had this money just it felt like it magically appeared, right? If we as a community as an, and as a society look at, make, look at doing things that's going to impact everybody and not looking at these things that, you know, we, politics plays such a huge role, you know, um, in our country and in our state that we forget that we can do some things that's going to support people, that's going to make, um, public safety, a central part of our society that's going to um, um, have thriving communities. We can actually do it, but we've been so inundated with the politics that folks um, forget that, you know, there's, um, we have um, the closed MSDF campaign, right? The Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. It's a horrible place, right? We can provide support and resources. You talk about resources, Judge, like the resources are there. We just have to figure out as a community how we put the right resources in the right places to make the greatest impact. I say that it can be done. We know it can be done. We stopped sending young people to Lincoln Hills. We pushed um, um, caseworkers to say, no, what else can we do? And guess what? They rose to the occasion. They said, oh, we can find them a different placement. We can find more supportive services. It can be done. We just need the, the leadership. We need our community to continue to stand up to say, we are no longer going to take this sitting down. And it's going to take all of us from every single level, from every area of leadership, and, and community to pull together and say, you know what, this can be done. Let's do it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as I, we talked about the, the opportunity to talk about the Charm City, but it's really also a focus here on Milwaukee. And I know uh, Chief uh, Brunson, you've been very supportive of reaching out dialoguing, trying to get information. That is something that you take pride in, correct? Rightfully so? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you have to communicate. Sometimes, and especially in this climate, what I'm seeing across the country from some leaders is a retrenchment because of the perceived attacks 
that law enforcement is receiving right now. I mean, I will say this. I've been on the job for 25 years. And this climate is different than anything I've ever seen as it relates to law enforcement. I personally call this the post-George Floyd era of law enforcement. I talked about this at the promotional ceremonies that I just uh, led recently and about how that was a paradigm shift as it relates to law enforcement. The George Floyd, it galvanized the whole country and frankly, the whole world. And so some law enforcement leaders have a tendency because of the perceived attacks to be more insular, to be more resistant. But I would say it's the time for us to reach out more, to listen more, to find out what the community is saying. And the challenges that we face right now, and we all know this in Milwaukee, is the level of violence that we have. And we cannot address that issue with a lack of trust between the police department and the community. You saw in Baltimore, their homicide clearance rate is 38%. 38%, that's abysmal. That means that 62% of the individuals that commit a homicide in Baltimore get away with it. That is just totally unacceptable. And one of the reasons why is because unfortunately, the lack of legitimacy, the other cultural issues in Baltimore, and I've done a lot of research on Baltimore and a lot of their issues. Baltimore is not much bigger than Milwaukee population wise. It's only about 20,000 more. But last year they had 348 homicides. By comparison, Milwaukee had a little less than 100. We were right, right around 97. So here's a city almost the same size as us, but they had more than three times the homicides and only 38% of them are being solved. And so what I'm saying is, is that you have to have the trust and the perceived legitimacy from the community or you're not gonna be effective in addressing the level of violence because it takes, we've already talked about it, it takes multifaceted approaches, not just even law enforcement and the community. You need community-based organizations, you need faith-based organizations, you need other members of the criminal justice system, you need all of those things working together in order to address issues. And when there is a breakdown in the relationship then that means that things are not working as effectively as they could be to make a change and to make a difference. So Baltimore, I just read a book as a matter of fact about the Baltimore Police Department. It's called, I Got a Monster. And if you read that book, it's pretty scary as what some members of the Baltimore Police Department were doing. I mean, we're talking about levels of corruption that's just beyond. I mean, we've had issues in Milwaukee but some of the things that you read about that this unit did was just beyond the pale. And so when things like that are known, in addition to Freddie Gray, and, and obviously there's cities all over the country, and we've had issues here, no doubt. But when you have those incidents, it just impacts the relationship even more and drives a wedge, unfortunately, between police and the community that we all need to bridge that gap. And so that's what I'm committed to try to do here in Milwaukee. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate it. Shanae, your, your title is uh, social, Vice President of Social Responsibility. How does some of these things impact what you do and vice versa? Um, you know, I always, I always tell people that the, the title um, is just a name, um, a fancy name for truly engaging the community and being intentional with convening in, in areas where, again, recognizing that we can't do things alone. And so under that umbrella, uh, Judge Ashley, it incorporates our commitment um, that I'm leading on advancing inclusion internally um, and then looking to partners externally to truly become an anti-racist, multicultural organization. 
Um, and looking at that from the perspective of how that shows up as an individual, um, and once we're able to navigate through that process, how that impacts the organization from a commitment perspective, and then how we can engage the community. So that's one component of it. The other component of it also engage, it involves how we are able to look at um, who can support our efforts and not just the efforts of the YMCA and our mission, but the efforts of the collective community. Because again, we recognized a long time ago that having a physical dwelling in a community is not, is not going to just cut it. Um, you know, building it and expecting people to come is not going to cut it. Um, being prescriptive is not going to cut it. And so a lot of my role too involves connecting with those individuals or collect, connecting with like-minded organizations whose missions also align with ours to figure out how we can truly put places or put programs in place for our members, for our young people, for our active older adults and things of that nature. Um, and it also involves engaging our local public officials we recognize and understand that without their leadership at the table, without their voices at the table, without us informing them of some of the things that we'd like to do in partnership with others, that is not going to go anywhere. And so that's a lot of the, the work that I lead. And I think that someone mentioned something a little bit earlier, too, when you think about what the uh, commitment is. This is not a role that I've, I've recognized um, for the faint at heart, um, because in saying all of this, um, you know, being a, a nonprofit executive for nearly 20 years, I have seen the ebbs and flows. Um, I have seen, you know, what has been that shiny object of the hot thing to follow. And if you're not consistent with that, it falls by the wayside. And so just knowing that I'm able to work alongside of others whose mission um, is very similar to my own personal one makes the work a lot easier and more fulfilling, I should say. Thank you, Shanae. Imani, can you talk about your involvement uh, with teen program coordination for the PEAK initiative and the impact that you see relative to the movie and just what you do? Absolutely. Um, and hearing, hearing nonprofit reminds me of, I know I'm young, but I've had the chance to um, operate uh, with many different nonprofits over my time um, working with Urban Underground being in the program as well as being a staff member there and also being a public ally has really given me a large scope of, you know, just what it means to be engaged in your community, whether it be from a place of uh, being an activist or for me, I, I, I feel like I approach youth work and approach work in the community from a unique lens as far as just really working on instilling the value of self-love into my community, the young people, all people that I encounter. And I think that that conversation is so, so important because a lot of time we try to tackle issues from the top down versus just getting to the root of the issue. And a lot of us really struggle with just identifying who we are and loving ourselves where we are. And that's such a, it seems very simple, but it can be very complex and people really have a difficult time with that. And so I operate my own business called Naturally Beautiful, where that's my message. And I'm able to take that message into the work that I do in the community with young people and help expose them to that conversation, as well as um, share with them the importance of entrepreneurship and helping young people, you know, look at the option of starting their own business um, and just uh, collaborative economics and having that conversation with them at a young age and showing them that no matter what it is that they want to do, they can start now and they don't have to wait until they're older, until they graduate college or whatever their goals may be. And just really, really, really helping them understand how um, important that is and making sure that they have a mentor and a support system because like uh, Reggie and Charlotte have provided that resource for me, I wanted to make sure I was able to provide the same thing. What a gift to our community, Imani. What a gift to our community you are. Uh, Reggie, can you talk a little bit, you referred to it a little bit earlier, the blueprint for peace. Can you let our audience know a little bit more about that? Um, sure. In, in 2017, we engaged um, a thousand young people and over a thousand adults um, across the community in identifying what the priority should be for addressing violence as a public health issue. Um, uh, you know, I think historically, Milwaukee's not alone. I think, you know, as a country, um, violence has been addressed strictly from a criminal justice, individual kind of behavioral problem. And when you look at the similarities and conditions of where which violence is concentrated, the conditions in Baltimore are very similar to the conditions in Milwaukee. The history of redlining, the history of mass incarceration, 
um, all of these things, the, the concentrated you know, unemployment. And even though you know, they have John Hopkins University um, all around the university, it pretty much reflects if you're a fan of The Wire like I am, you know, that's pretty much, you know, the the tale of two cities literally um, blocks from each other. And so, you know, just, just understanding that uh, violence is a learned behavior when we look at it on an individual level, understanding that there are conditions and policies um, that perpetuate violence, that perpetuate concentrated poverty, um, and that we all have to be accountable. We all have to roll up our sleeves um, and work on addressing this and not simply relying um, on courts and cages to deal with um, issues of mental health, to deal with issues of poverty, to deal with issues of food insecurity. Um, and I think COVID has also um, increased a sense of urgency around that and the racial disparities that exist when people don't have access to quality preventative health care um, and the impact of that. So the Blueprint for Peace pretty much contains six goals and 30 strategies um, that include everything from um, restorative justice and healing, preventing gun violence, um, looking at uh, strengthening children, youth, and families, um, whether it's related to domestic violence, child abuse prevention, um, early childhood programming, um, also looking at economic development um, and strengthening neighborhoods. And so when you look at, for example, the creative corridor that's being built on 32nd and Center and the young brothers who are involved in that $60 million project, they want to embed the blueprint for peace in that project um, and look at um, including after school programming in that development, looking at how do they educate residents about domestic violence um, and other resources and supports um, that they may need in the community as they move in. Because um, as we talk to even property owners around the city, um, that's one of the things that they're speaking to even during COVID, that when they look at their security cameras or when they look at the report, the police reports and calls of service to their buildings, there's been a skyrocketing increase in domestic violence incidents. Some get reported, some don't. But when we look at the correlation of gun violence, it's clear. So families are struggling right now. Children are struggling. But again, the more that we invest on the front end, the less that we need to pay for on the back end. And so the blueprint really is a, a strategy and a vision for doing that. You know, uh, I want to go back to you, Charlotte, with uh, Urban Underground. You've done a lot of work in our community. You're involved in a number of areas. You want to talk a little bit about Urban Underground for, for our community here? Judge, you just want me to share a little bit about Urban Underground? Yeah, do. I don't want okay. to walk away and not know about Urban Underground. They can't walk yeah. away and not know. Let's get it out there. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, definitely, you know, myself and Reggie have been um, honored to um, co-create um, this organization that have um, reaped so many amazing youth leaders that are now amazing adults. Um, I can't say enough, you know, sometimes when uh, um, after Reggie had left the organization and now runs the um, runs the Office of Violence Prevention, you know, sometimes I think, hey, there's some other things that I can do. And, you know, and then folks are just like, no, you can't leave Urban Underground. Um, I am now am fortunate to have the young people that were in Urban Underground from the early 2000s, their children are now in the organization. Um, our, our children <laughs> are now in urban underground. It's just the you know most amazing thing. But when um, and I think Imani said this best as well. It's the, it's the part of giving back, um, and it's the part of um, building relationships with young people. Um, that's what this city needs. This city, and and not just from an organization like Urban Underground. You have you know, what Andre Lee Ellis, and I wish he was on to really, you know, the passion that that man has and the the love and care that he has when he talks to young people, you know, it's, it's an a, a absolute gift that he has given us. And there's so many people um, that are sprinkled in our city that are, that are just like him, that are filling diff various roles in our community. And, you know, not for the accolades, not for the money, because Lord knows that there's not a lot of money in this, but because we genuinely love our community. We genuinely love these young people and want better, but because of the all the other um, elements that are going on, we just want to pour back in um, to our community. And so um, Urban Underground um, will continue 
um, to pour back into the lives of young people through leadership, leadership development and activism, allowing young people to know that they have a voice, um, that they have power, you know, a type of power that they can rise up and utilize when it says, you know what, hey, bro, did you, you know, are you registered to vote, sis? Are, you know, um, are you registered to vote? Like using their collective power to make um, some lasting and impressionable changes. And so um, it takes all of us and um, it's definitely that all hands on deck approach. Thank you. Thank Sarah. you. Much appreciated. You know, I want to ask the panelists uh, two things that have affected everybody, and that's COVID. And as uh, the chief talked about George Floyd and Jacob Blake and those issues, they create um, angst, but also, I think, opportunity. I know the chief judge, uh, Mary Trejan, and I, uh, as we work with the court system, uh, she often says, shame on us if we come up doing the same things we did pre-COVID. pre, pre, pre -COVID. And there are certain opportunities that have come about for us to do things genuinely better than we did before. Uh, and we hope that we definitely come up better because we just cannot. What are your observations about George Floyd and COVID and opportunities and, and limitations it's created? I, I do like your point, Sherilyn. I have to say, when you said, well, how did they get all this money to give these give these folks this money. Prioritization, the will. What are your thoughts about COVID and George Floyd, the protests and the impact that has plus or minus? The one put by the spotter name. I'm trying to step back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Come on, Shanae. Uh, Carl, Judge Carl Ashley. <laughs> I know. That's a loaded I, one. I know you tread carefully, guys. I'm not asking anybody to jump on out there, but yeah, but no, it's it's a, it's a great one, right? Um, I actually re recently wrote a piece um, that I that I shared on LinkedIn, and it was titled "Am I Being Bold Enough?" And it basically um, encapsulated the um, collision, as I've as I've called it, between COVID, um, the first pandemic, and then obviously the second pa pandemic when the world woke up and recognized that we have been dealing with systemic racism for 400, 401 years. Um, I believe when you, when you think about resources and the ails and the ills that many of us have experienced for decades, I believe that the world was finally able to see that um, on March 15th or March 18th, when the COVID cases here in Milwaukee started to um, get reported. Um, and then going even deeper when our health commissioner and the Office of Violence Prevention and others were able, able to uncover even more what the disparities and the inequities look like for black and brown communities. And so quite frankly, it was pretty daunting um, to read that. And then also trying to figure out, you know, how is this going to impact my family? You know, anyone in my family that may have pre-existing conditions or any of my family's loved ones or just our neighbors, right? And, and, and how that and, and, and what that looks like. And then still having to go to work. So just when you feel as though you are um, trying to figure it out, you know, we quickly, like very, like other organizations, we quickly adjusted um, to be responsive to what the community truly needed. And then George Floyd occurred. The whole entire world watched and witnessed a man get murdered. And I um, shared in my piece that I went from being. Um, very quiet, you know, asking a lot of questions. People were calling me, asking for responses. People that they didn't look like me wanted to know what exactly they should they should do. And I didn't have a sense of peace, right? I felt very unsettled. Um, I've been able to be still, but I felt very unsettled. And I had to remind myself, um, and I'm so, so thankful for my daughters who are activists in their own right. I have two girls um, who pushed and propelled me and my family to say, hey, we were built for this. This is tough. Um, we're going to get through it. But I have to honestly say that I gave myself permission to say that I'm exhausted um, because you're just inundated with constant reminders of what's occurring, not only in our respective community, but across the world. So whether you turn on your television, whether you turn on your radio, um, it's the constant chatter of everything that's happening. But with that same thing, and I'll wrap this up, um, is a glimmer of hope and optimism. 
um, because I'm a woman of faith. And because of being a woman of faith, I'm extremely hopeful and optimistic because what we've been asking the world to recognize for years is that please see us, you know, see us and see us um, and be committed by way of resources, be committed by way of activity, be, be committed by way of activation to support what we're doing. And because that's happening in the various conversations that I'm in and the various circles that I'm in, both within my organization and externally, um, the conversations are continuing and that gives me hope and, and optimism. So tired, long way to say tired, exhausted, but hopeful at the same time. Thank you, Shanae. Thank you. Other comments on that? That was, I think that was just beautiful, beautifully said. I would just say really quick, um, it was, you know, COVID was the gift and the curse. Um, my heart goes out to families that have lost loved ones um, during this time. Um, it was that unveiling, that, that unveiling of um, the inequities um, in this country, in our, in our own community, but it also pushed us. I saw um, leadership, I saw from the, from the neighborhood level um, rise to the top, how folks came out and supported um, each other. Um, and the, the time where our um, you know, elected officials, um, you, know, you had a person like David Bowen who was in the streets every single day, um, you know, marching with the people, right? Uh, there, there, we come to that time where now is the time where we know that there are certain things that we can do and I think we have to continue to push to say, let's continue to do them. Let's continue to look at alternatives. Let's continue to talk about um, what does having a true transformative justice system look like? Like we're in this moment and we definitely need that permission to say, let's do it. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you very much. Um, Reggie, can you tell me, because you have a very challenging um, responsibility about the Office of Violence Prevention, and COVID has certainly exacerbated some of the issues that we're dealing with, particularly with lethal um, homicides and the like. And what is your, how has this impacted what you do day to day? Um, I, I think it, you know, there's always sort of this balance between, and in public health, we always sort of straddle between primary prevention um, in terms of, you know, things that every um, human being in our population and particularly young people should be exposed to quality after school programs, mm -hmm. youth employment, social emotional learning. Um, and then you have to also look at um, intervention. And so when we look at our 401 for life work, where we have individuals who have either been exposed to some level of risk or trauma as a result of gun violence, who needs support and redirection and healing. Um, and so it's sort of um, balancing between sort of the proactive primary prevention um, as well as um, in you know crisis response. And I feel like um, this entire year we've been in a state of crisis mm -hmm. um, with two mass shootings, um, with ongoing gun violence, uh, particularly as it relates to interfamily, um, intimate partner and domestic violence has been significant. And so, Again, just continuing to fund and resource and build the capacity of youth serving agencies and after school programs um, who have struggled to return to in person programming, particularly as it relates to this summer, while at the same time um, intervening. I mean, the 414 Life team, shout out to them, um, have interrupted at least 100 um, conflicts that could have resulted in gun violence. So, although I hate to say things could be worse, they absolutely could be worse. Um, and so again, it's often hard to tell the story of what didn't happen, um, but that's what prevention is about. And unfortunately, we take peace for granted. Um, and unfortunately, we've made peace with trauma as a society where we expect gun violence. And um, when we hear gunshots go off, you know, I've heard the police department talk about shot spotter may catch it, but nobody calls the police. And so the fact that gunshots in our community have become normalized is a problem and I think is reflective of the trauma and the conditions um, that have produced the level of violence that we're seeing. But again, we have to understand and, and operate with a level of hope, a level of optimism and a level of determination to understand that the world that we were all born into isn't the world that we have to die in. And I think our ancestors have demonstrated that and it's time for us to take that torch and, and move it forward. 
Yes. Thank you, Rich. Well said. Rich. Chief, did you want to respond about the impact this has had on, on the police department or, or youth for that matter? Well, COVID obviously impacted us as an agency. I think um, obviously it changed the way that we operated day to day. Um, in addition to that, I would have to say, and I don't know if, if we can empirically prove the correlation between COVID and what's happening in our city this year. But we do know that we've had a, a great increase in domestic violence related gun violence. We also know that the number of road rage shootings this year has greatly increased. People are on edge. And unfortunately, with the proliferation of guns, now when people get into disputes, what we're seeing is that they're very, very quickly going to utilizing that handgun. And so that's what we've, we've had a 70% increase in non-fatal shootings this year and over a hundred percent increase in homicides this year. So this has been a, a, a really trying year for us as an agency, just based on the things that have happened in our city. And obviously we had the civil unrest and we have had personal tragedy recently too with the murder our community service officer over something so insignificant it's just it's just sad I, there's nothing else that you can say about what happened in that situation and then unfortunately the suicide of our one of the officers that i knew very well um last week so this has just been a a trying year for us as an agency um looking forward as far as the george floyd situation how does that impact us if you look at the Milwaukee Police Department, and I've said this repeatedly, and Reggie, you heard me earlier say that a number of reform items were being discussed. I think that the George Floyd situation just enhanced that and sped up that process to a certain degree where we're already in motion with the Collins Agreement, also known as the ACLU Agreement, and in addition to that, our FPC, as far as the changes as it relates to eight can't wait. So all of those things as a result of the George Floyd situation, I think, has enhanced and sped up the timetable in implementing the changes that were some things in motion already. And so what is that going to do? I think that the Collins Agreement, along with the changes, will definitely change the way that the Milwaukee Police Department operates moving forward, which will lead to a more constitutionally sound police agency, a more fair agency. And so that's obviously what we want to see, a more equitable and fair agency. That's what we're striving for. We know we have a ways to go. We have incidents like the recent incident that occurred where the two officers use force and unacceptable conduct against a homeless individual. You know, in that case, it wasn't race, but in some instances, you have officers that are, are aggressive and they're prone to misconduct. And, you know, sometimes it's a race issue. Sometimes it's just a, a mentality issue. And so, you know, my job as a leader and our job in law enforcement is to root those individuals out because we cannot have individuals like that who are abusing their power and that's what creates that schism, as I talked about earlier, between the community and law enforcement. Thank you, Chief. All right, we're running out of time. So what I'd like to do is this. Uh, I think the panelists, you've been just outstanding. What I'd like to do is give each of you uh, an opportunity to give a short closing statement, a message, if you will, that you would like to give before we, we close and, and thank uh, those folks who are responsible for giving us this wonderful opportunity uh, to work with the Minority uh, Film Festival. So uh, I'm gonna do it uh, as my screen is. So Chief, you're on top. So you wanna make any uh, closing comment to the, the audience? Well, I would just like to say that, um, I mean, wrapping into you know Charm City and into Milwaukee, I think you saw, I talked about some of the statistics in Baltimore, and even though they have challenges before them, just like we do, there is hope. There is hope. 
there are citizens, there are police officers, there are community-based organizations, there are politicians, there are broad ranges across all spectrums of society that are working together to try to improve conditions. And so, as we talked about, Milwaukee has those things also. And so when they work together, when those relationships are working collaboratively, then we can be much more effective as a community, as a city to affect and impact many of the challenges that we face. And so I think that we can see kind of an archetype or an example from Baltimore that many of those structures and things are already in place here in Milwaukee and we just have to move forward, mend fences where they might have been broken and try to move forward together. Thank you, Chief. Shanae? I would just say if we can just really um, continue to hold ourselves accountable as individuals and hold ourselves accountable um, in our respective circles of influence. Um, so as a call to action, what, you know, what have our, what has our audience taken away from this discussion? Um, just learning about some of the statistics that are impacting us in our very own backyard um, that we're going to do differently. Um, how does that show up in the form of communication and conversation within our respective workplaces? Um, I have a, I have a dear friend that says, how are we making moves where we lead, right? Um, how are, how are we, how are we influencing those around us or how are we influencing those that we're sitting at tables with for that change that needs to occur? I think it's also important too that we continue to espouse this, this mindset and practice and behavior of being empathetic and demonstrating empathy. Um, because I also, I, I also believe that that is going to go a long way. And I, as I stated a little bit earlier, um, just remaining hopeful and optimistic because we do have the attention that we've been asking for. And now it's just a matter of what are we going to do with it? Understanding that we do have resources. I mean, this, this community is inundated with organizations. There are so many nonprofit organizations that are in this community. The donors, if, they, if we had a donor, a donor representative on this call today, they would tell you that they really look forward to organizations partnering um, because there's only so many resources to go around. So when we think about the capacity that we have as organizations to truly work together um, for that for that collective impact, I believe that that is something that could be substantial. And let's not underscore the opportunities that we could that we can gain from our faith based community as well. Thank you, Shane. Reggie. Um, given that it's Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and um, the the tragic you know, loss of, of Officer Klein. I just want to highlight and encourage people to um, pay attention to each other and to be kind to each other um, and to show empathy, just to underscore what Shanae just mentioned. Um, and if people are in need of help, to reach out to the 24-hour crisis line with Milwaukee County at 414-257-7222. Um, we have lost several members of our community over the past few years um, that have been well-known individuals, but there's also people um, who suffer and die in silence. And so, um, again, when it comes to depression, when it comes to just all of the stress and pressure that a lot of people are feeling um, in these times, just know that you're not alone and that you're loved. Um, and, you know, again, please reach out for our support. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Uh, Nani? I definitely agree with a lot of what I've heard. Um, as the closing remarks. And once again, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. It was definitely um, something I'm grateful to be a part of. I would say um, the last thing that, that I wanna leave with people is just continue to have people who are most impacted a part of the conversations and making sure that everyone at the table feels like they have some sort of responsibility to um, help the overall betterment of our community in Milwaukee. A lot of times we, we don't give people that sense of responsibility so they don't see um, what like what point it is to be a part of the conversation or what reason they have to be a part of um, helping Milwaukee be, become a better place. So I think we need to continue to lift up the voices of those who are most impacted, young people, people of color, 
um, all of those folks should have a sense of responsibility of helping us make Milwaukee better. Thank you, Iman. Thank you. Charlie, bring us home. Uh, that was beautiful. Um, the title of today's session was A Pathway to Peace, Race, Trauma, and Community Resilience. I want the audience that is listening today to think about what role do you play? We, a lot of times we sit here and point the finger, what are you gonna do? And what are you gonna do? What are they gonna do, right? I want everybody to look within. What are you going to do? And a lot of times it doesn't take much. You have your own, you can, you can invest your time, you can invest your talent, you can invest your resources. It's going to take the entire community, it's going to take all of us in order to transform the conditions that and, and the ills that our communities are dealing with, all of us. So if you sit in a position of leadership, speak up. Now is the time more than ever to not be quiet, to not sit back, to not allow, you know, the jokes or the, you know, the, the slurs or to just, you know, thinking, oh, well, I just won't say anything. This is the time for each of us and all of us to step up and do our part, whatever that may be. And if you don't know, reach out to some folks, ask them, how can you support? How can you be engaged? How can you love on somebody, right? This is the time more than ever to do that. And I really love what Imani said, make sure that if you look around the table and you see that, huh, there's some people that are missing, guess what? It's gonna be your responsibility to invite them, to find them, to bring them to the table because the changes that needs to happen is going to be with the people that are absolutely most impacted. Judge Ashley, thank you so much for allowing us to um, come together and have this conversation um, and to every single person um, on this panel. Um, we appreciate it but I want folks to know it doesn't stop here. Thank you, Sherilyn. You know what, um, when we put this panel together, the only, the only thing that I have is technology really bothers me sometimes because Andre Ellis would have been marvelous on it. That, yes. that gentleman does so much in our community for everybody, but boys in particular. And if you haven't seen him when he got all the tuxes for the kids, you gotta see that because it's just a statement of his commitment to make things better and give kids opportunity they would not have. I am extraordinarily grateful for all our panelists, Chief Brunson, Janae Jenkins, Reggie Moore, Imani Ray, Charlotte Moore, Andre Lee Ellis. So you're there. I know you're there. You're there. You're there. You were part of this panel. And I also want to thank the, uh, the film festival for allowing us to participate uh, in this program, the Minority Health Film Festival 2020. Uh, and I want to give a big shout out uh, to Gerard Blanks for allowing us and working with us and allowing this all to come together. And on behalf of the Race, Equity and Procedural Justice Committee, we're looking for input. Hopefully we'll give you something to connect up, uh, a email address or to reach out to the CJC. There's a spot for us there. We want to hear voices. We want to do better. So as we end, I want to go with something that Charlie said. We do a lot, but I think I can do more And you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everyone. All right. The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a... The 2020 Minority Health Film Festival offers a diverse variety of films and events that we just wouldn't be able to offer in the in-person cinema experience. But I think what really makes it unique is the focus, not only on public health issues, but the issues that really concern communities of color. If you're looking for a reason to engage or to try it out, this is the perfect time. Just go to mkefilm.org slash mhff 